Hello, and thanks for joining us on the podcast that discusses all things gaming. Coming to you from the home of Gen Con and the gaming capital of the world, this is The Established Fact. Hey guys, hey guys, look, listen, I've got so I've got something perfect for the contest. What? Uh, Josh. 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 Sweetie. Hang on. Sweetie, just Josh. hang on a second. Easy. Chupa. Oh, oh Lord. I don't know which part of the galaxy you've managed to float yourself into, but I just gotta be honest. We could really use you right now. We've kinda gotten ourselves into a bit of a bind. You see, we've been surrounded by the Mandalorian fleet and our one ship, and Cowboy can't be contacted. So if you're hiding somewhere close by, please, come out of the shadows and give us a hand. Your furry friend, Lobaka. Winning stuff, right? It was beautiful. What's a Lobaka? Mike, you play in the game with me. Lobaka, my Wookiee? What's a Wookiee? Don, really? Is it like a gnome or... An orc? Deb, you know Star Wars better than I do. What's Star Wars? Who's Deb? And what's a Wookiee? Wait, who are you guys? We're the winners in postcards from a dungeon. I, how can there already be winners? The contest is over. What? Yeah, I, it ended six days ago. Oh my god, I have spent the last few weeks just trying to get these little recordings down for the three of you and you're telling me that I can't even submit my own? Yeah. Yeah. Weeks put in on this podcast. Completely completely engulfed by all these different gaming topics. And I can't even represent the podcast I put all this time into. We have have a a podcast? podcast? Yes. We have a podcast. At www. Dot the established facts dot com. Oh. Bonus. 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 Hello, everybody, and I would like to welcome you to the established facts. First off, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in the uh, contest for Postcards in a Dungeon. Uh, it was super excited, exciting times, uh, and I know Josh is over there uh, sulking. Absolutely. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's bitter. <laughs> Just a teeny bit. <laughs> There's there horseradish. Oh. 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 That was bad. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, no, See, no. he took my thunder. I was going to say he's only... Bitter about an Ewok size. But. Oh. oh, yours is just as bad. Yeah, but mine's not about produce. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves uh, for the show. This, uh, this, t- I guess, this episode. If I could talk correctly, uh, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Starting with my left. Mmm. This is Big Don. This is Doctor Deb. I'm back. This Guess who's back? <laughs> it's Josh. And live via satellite from Tampa, Florida. This is Anton. Hi ho. No, so that's, and I'm back too. Oh yeah, it's that's to the right of where we right. are. <laughs> Not yeah. Jeez. To the south. I failed uh, right? geography. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so um we have a uh, request to uh talk about um a versus topic from uh, a, a poster in the Fear the Boot forums. Uh, so we are going to break that down. Uh, so our versus topic today is going to be using um, digital books or having the hard books in front of you uh, for your gaming supplies. So uh, do you prefer you know, having the, the 
Pathfinder core rulebook there, so you can flip through all the pages and have it all, or, or does it really matter uh, if you just have a, an electronic PDF that you flip through on your iPad or whatnot? So, uh, without any further ado, we're going to go around the table in reverse order, starting live via satellite. Mr. Anton. Uh, digital. I think it's because he lives in a digital world, but we'll find that out. Um, I'm going to have to go with digital as well, but I love collecting the hard books. I love having them. I just tend to use the digital more. Um, I would have to say the hard books. Books. Uh, I'm going to go with the old-fashioned paper. <laughs> Mighty conservative of you, Donald. <clears throat> well, you know. I think if we're just uh, strictly speaking about books uh, versus the PDFs of the books, I am a uh, book person as well. Mm-hmm. So um, Josh and Anton are uh, holding the fort down on the digital side. So, uh, fellas, convince us that uh, digital books are better. Awesome. I'll go. Go. We win. I, uh, <laughs> we win. For for me, especially now that I live out here, even when I but even when I lived in with you guys up there, um, it was all about the fact that like we online we share a collective library. Josh owns all the PDFs and but has opted to share them with us through a single source where he still owns ownership of the files. Uh, that but, and I only do it with no more than five people, which still falls under the Paizo license. It says you can have up to five active copies of any of them. Anyways, but even still, we have a library where we can keep a collective group of books. So if I don't personally own them, it makes it a lot harder to find the books. That's fair. That's I, I, I see that as well. I use it per, purely for ease of use because it's a lot easier for me, especially if I'm sitting here with a computer, to have like six books open and just go, I need to go here to this page and quickly swing through it. Whereas, because that can take up about the space of about two inches wide, maybe, if it's stacked up. Whereas if you look at five Pathfinder books in particular, because that's where we mostly collect, you know, those can be anywhere from... A foot, foot and a half tall in books as you're trying to pull and swing through, and it's a lot easier to manipulate through them if you're trying to do multiple books at a time. For for me, though, what really was icing on the cake was the years at John and Danielle's waiting on books. Uh, you can't you can't refute that fact. I will give you that point, <laughs> Donald. Yes. Stand your ground, sir. Mm, well, um, I would have to say the reason that. I, I, I enjoy, and I, I will definitely stand behind using the physical uh, paper media that um, is printed and published, and I think that really it's it's more of a probably more of just an eclectic taste of having having that access in front of you all the time. Now I know that the books can be a little bit heavier, and I don't. I don't dispute the fact that when you're creating a character, uh, it's a lot easier for you to use like a PDF version of the book because, like you said, you can flip through. um, You know, if you're using an archetype from Advanced Player's Guide and you're picking a feat from Ultimate Combat, it's easier to be able to have all those PDFs in front of you so you can just click from one to the next to the next. And, yeah, if you have multiple people, like, you know, I started running a game... um, last week and we had eight people uh sitting at the table all using well we had nine people but eight of them creating characters for that specific game um when you only have two or three core rule books at the table and you've got you know seven or eight people sitting down building a core class from those books it's kind of difficult for you to be able to share three books when you're all making different uh you're all making different class characters so <clears throat> having the access to the pdf can definitely be an advantage especially if you own the pdf and then you turn around and maybe print off your source material that you need to create your stuff and then you can turn around and let someone else use your book um but i i feel like just being able to have the quick access to the table of contents and a book and being able to just flip immediately to the page that you need Versus having to 
having to go back and try and find everything and then you know I understand you can put the number of page in there but it's not always exactly the same and you got to flip through pages just to find where you really want um, plus a big thing for me and I use this even in school with my textbooks and things like that is the index and the glossary being able to kind of define terms and and uh, and I know that all that stuff is in the digital media but I don't know it's just so- something something about being able to just physically open your book to that area immediately and know exactly where it's at you know it's it's just a much more convenient uh thing for me to do is to be able to use a book so carrie you agree um yes i am basically a bookworm so pretty much anything in book form is all right with me even reading books like i'd rather have them in my hand than like on a you know iPad or a Nook. Yeah, or anything, or a Kindle or anything like that. So, Dr. Deb, I mean, you should be, you should be sick of books with all of your studies. So uh, why is it that you'd rather have the book in front of you than falling out of your chair? <laughs> <laughs> you doing okay over there, I'm, I'm good. The, okay. the chair tried to dump me out the back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Derek's chair you tried to dump him. Actually, you did a know, beautiful right? demonstration of, of one of my issues, and that is that technology will fail us on occasion. Now, I know my husband's going to give me a dirty look and Tony's going to stab through the screen, but... I wouldn't have a job if it didn't fail. Exactly. When is the last time a book (laughs) failed? I'm just pointing that out. Okay, well, that's not the book failing. uh, That okay. explodes? Yes, that's true, but I don't think your computer you would have survived to that say either. It, didn't you? Yeah, yes. I did. Okay. I don't think your computer would have survived that either. I'm, I'm just Not saying. Not this one, but there are ones that will. True. I don't have that much money, so here we go. The other <laughs> issue is that I do. Uh, I own an iPad, and my husband has gotten me loads and loads of the books on this iPad. I don't like to use it because the reason is I flip so fast. Like I, I find what I need. Okay, I need that spell. I'm sitting there and I'm waiting. 10, 15 seconds for my iPad to figure out, oh my gosh, this page and load this page. And now I've got these fun little check boxes that are slowly filling in with the page. And I'm just like, I just want to read two sentences in the silly spell. Okay. And this would have been faster if I could have just flipped to the book. Okay. There it is. Uh, or it, it's, it is a touch that I need on this. That's all I needed. I didn't need to wait 25 seconds for the silly thing to load. Um, so efficiency is also part of it. The other thing is, is kind of what you or said. patience. Ooh, I'm a doctor. I need it like 10 seconds ago. Anyway. Um, stat. Stat. Yeah, yes. Stat. Um, that's satisfying. Anyway. Listen, um, <laughs> listen to us TV watchers. We need yeah. stat. <laughs> we still use that in the hospital. It's, okay. Although it usually tends to be a little more dramatic of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Stat. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. House. Okay. Um, so I think that's one issue. The other one is... There are often things that I will use over and over again, certain, either they're um, charts or tables or, you know, I always go to the same table in the equipment list in the Pathfinder to, okay, how much gold does this cost? Okay, where's the crit range? Because I don't have it all memorized. And so I always go there. And so it will get a little worn just where I'm at that one spot because I go there all the time as opposed to a PDF where I'm like, okay, it was around page. No, that was two pages off. So now I'm flipping, trying to figure out where was I, whereas in a book, bam it'll just okay it's worn right there yep there it is and it's i can get to it quicker in a book as opposed to a pdf so similar thought though is if you get used to i'm a i tend to do more of the page number element of it uh the only page number that i can tell right off the top of my head is either 398 or 399 is where the gold levels are for each level in Mm -hmm. the pathfinder system Mm -hmm. and i remember that because i've done it more on a pdf Mm -hmm. and thus in turn i can put it 398 or 39 and i can if i pick up a book i go well i need to go to page 398 and i know that 398 is the same thing in both elements are you sure because I've had several issues where it doesn't match. The book it, pages are different from the It PDF. is if you it use depends. Paizo's. Paizo actually pa- does the theirs out. It's okay. the start. The start first page is actually page one. Okay. Not the cover page, because they'll say cover page. Cover right. Page, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because that the, was an issue other, that I had with some. The other trick to that is is using bookmarks in PDFs, hmm. where bookmarks right. will can you can just there's a lot of times most most computers and most tablets have a side column where you can open up bookmarks, you can set bookmarks, and that'll be you can just go oh look I need the gold page and you can write a bookmark that says gold level page or whatever and click that it opens the page up and then you're not even you're not wasting time at all, so. Um, I think. Uh 
though, on the other side of that, uh, one thing that I find as a GM and anybody who's run a game should be able to uh, at least understand where I'm coming from, if not agree. When you're sitting there, and uh, when I when I like to plan out my uh, my actual uh, sessions, and and I'm looking through to find stats or or something like that, if I have a group of monsters, but they are different monsters, it's easier for me to be able to hold, okay, well, I'm going to use a goblin, so I can hold this page, and then I can flip through, and, oh, I'm also going to add a copper dragon, that's back here, and I can hold that page, and then you can literally, what I like about having that physical book is being able to just open, okay, okay, there's my stats real quick, and then I can go to my goblin, oh, okay, there's my stats there too, and if I need to flip to something else, I can hold all those pages, where in a PDF form, yeah, you can bookmark it, and you can flip and click between each one. But the only other way you can do that is if you open the same media multiple times and you open it to that page, which yeah. works exactly the same way. But I guess it's just having – it's it's just a difference of having the convenience physically versus the convenience digitally. And I think it's just a matter – I mean, it's this is not one of those kind of versus topics where it's like really heated necessarily because I use both. I print off um, uh, I print off character sheets and stuff like that. Obviously, that normally comes out of the book format from the PDF, or if you have the PDF of the character sheet, you know, I print off my Pathfinder Society stuff um, because it's just easier to have all of that accessible at any given time. If that's you know the the Pathfinder Society pamphlet, I think is like four pages something like that yeah yeah and you know and the pdf is free to download and so you know i have a copy of that for my uh pathfinder society account my wife's pathfinder society account you know we print them off that way whenever we're actually sitting down at a table not that it's happened yet but sitting down at a table to play a pathfinder society game you have all that stuff right there at your fingertips you don't have to worry about getting online to download it again or something like that there's another element here that's that's the especially with the digital world and Paizo, I can say specifically, other places like Indie Press Revolution, um, who's come out with some of the smaller games, Fiasco is sold through them, uh, Dread is sold through them, uh, they're making alternate options available yeah. for people now, so you can buy the physical book from pretty much anywhere. I mean, if you buy the the core rule book for Pathfinder from Paizo, it's $50. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can get it cheaper from Amazon or from half-price books or whatever, but you can also go to Paizo and say, I just want the PDF. Yep. It's 10 bucks. Yeah. You know, and th- there's an advantage to that because a lot of times, if you're on their website buying something, that usually means you have a, a computer or a tablet right. or something. So by being able to buy the PDF option, you're not adding physical stuff and you're keeping your costs down. And I will recommend that, though we are using Dropbox so that people can access multiple books, I will recommend to anybody. You want your own copy? Just go get it get from it, Paizo get and or, get yeah. the PDF copy from them. And it's totally, it's really easy. You pay for it and you're able to download it within a minute. Well, and I think uh, something that um, other other podcasts and and we have touched on before as well uh, is the convenience of using your materials outside of your home. Because you know, right now we're taking into the perspective that we're all sitting at our gaming table. You know, we've all got, you know, a big four foot by eight foot gaming table to set all the books that we want on it without too much of a problem. Mm-hmm. But when you leave to go somewhere else to play a game, for example, Gen Con, if you leave to go to Gen Con, it can become quite burdensome to carry two and three and four books with you for one game that you might only play one of the four days of Gen Con. And then you have to have a whole separate bag. I mean, I've gone through, you know, my wife and I have gone to Gen Con for eight years, and we've gone through the shuffle of, okay, so are we going to transload games into Ziploc bags so we have less boxes, so there's less bulk? You know, are we going to take books with us? What are we going to take? Because you may play two or three Pathfinder, you may play uh, three, you know, you may play a Pathfinder Society game every day at Gen Con, and that would constitute you maybe bringing your books, but having two and three books, you know, or more, depending on what you're playing, can be very, you know, it can be very laborsome, and it can start to wear on you, especially when you're walking around at a convention center or at a hotel, or even if you're just, if you're, even if you're at, like, Fear the uh, Fear the Con, <clears throat> and, you know, you play in a small area, but maybe after everything's over, 
you guys want to go out and have you know dinner or drinks or something like that, but you still want to take all that stuff with you because maybe you're not staying uh, at a hotel that's close to where the con is going on. Now you're transporting all that stuff with you and having it in a PDF form or on a tablet or on a laptop makes it a lot easier because then you go from carrying you know 30 pounds of books to carrying you know maybe an eight pound laptop. Go ahead, Deb. <clears throat> Well, an issue that we sort of faced a little bit at Fear of the Con, not too bad, is that all of your electronic stuff has to be charged, or you have to have a plug. And if everybody at your table is all working off of a laptop, and you all are looking for plugs, that can get really kind of weird pretty quick. Are we going to have a fight to figure out who gets the plug? Um, also, we had it with our phones, because we were using our phones quite a bit, and you know we were killing our phones. And so I was running around and sticking <coughs> plugs into random corners and hoping that that was allowed um, at the convention center so you know if your ipad's dead okay well crap i gotta charge it but my table's not near a plug so now i gotta have my ipad sitting around a bunch of strangers i'm not totally sure about um so that is a challenge whereas you know my books can stay near me i don't need to worry that my books need charging or you know any of <laughs> the, that the, the it, funny my thing books is... are mine and here they are and you touch them and you're gonna get beaten with them my, ba- my some... backpack <laughs> my backpack was lighter about the first time I got an iPad, and because of that same thing, my backpack is is as heavy as it was carrying one book now. Because now I have a power strip, mm-hmm. the laptop, and the iPad. Z. I have both of ours usually in the bag uh, because of the power strip issue. And uh, I understand that. Uh, so I, I I'm really pushing the you know, for all you major technology people listening to our podcast right now. <laughs> Um, there What's is that? point five. <laughs> right, there is a major push right now, and we we're seeing it happening in the technology world for better battery life on systems, especially yes, your mobile systems. <laughs> yeah, I will make one point. Um, something else you can do. They are available. They're they're typically used in a lot of hiking and other types of things. Is there are USB battery packs which allow you to plug in devices, and they are just a large cell battery. Um, the one in particular that I was looking at previously, it was designed for a MacBook Pro. It could run the MacBook Pro for 72 hours straight. So, and they could charge your phone like 400 times. So if you carry one of those, it's much lighter than carrying, it's about the same weight as your power strip, Josh. Yeah, but... Take, and so, take, but, but the thing about it is you don't have to worry about finding any power outlets for those kinds of things. But how much are they? They're, uh, the one I was looking at was uh, $199. But you, no. to keep in mind, that's something that can run a MacBook for seventy-two hours. Sure, I know, great. and, and they're, they're in better price range, and you're absolutely right on that. But, but that, that's, that's also the top end of the scale. Exactly. There are some that are on the fifty-dollar mark that could power your charge your cell phone five, ten, fifteen times, and that's something also you could take with you during the day. It's lightweight, it's small. You could put it in your pocket, and you can charge your phone ten or fifteen times, or you could. Uh, and then you, when you get back to your hotel room at night, you can charge it there. Heck, if you notice, even video game developers are starting to put, like, the controls. Like, a lot of game boxes now aren't even having the control schemes in them. They're putting them either in the game or making them available online for you to peruse and so forth because of how that, that shift towards the digital world. Um, but I'm with you. I will I will concede and agree that it, it is nice to have the book in front of you. And be able to swipe through things if if you don't. But for me, it's if I need just that one book, and you know, for fiasco, most of the time, all we need is the one book. There right. is a second book. Most of the time, it's all we need. Dread, you only need the one book. Quags, you only need the one book most of the time. Uh, and most video games, you usually only need your strategy guide, right. if that. So I'm totally with you on that. But when it becomes a multiple book scenario, yeah, yeah. And, I tend and like to lean towards digital. <clears throat> It's also different depending on what your gaming environment is. I mean, if you if you're one of those uh, if you're one of those gamers who goes out to play games, if you don't host games at your home, and you're you know if you're traveling a, a distance to be able to get to wherever your game location is, then yeah, I mean, carrying fifty to seventy five pounds of books just so you can create your character and then keep up with whatever your character has. It can be burdensome, but <clears throat> I think you know. I think another thing that really uh, helps people who use the physical book is, and my wife does this, but you just take notes on your character so that, like, as you're going through your character development for all your feats, if you want the full explanation on what your feats are, instead of carrying the book, just write it out. You know what I mean? And and carrying a notebook, a seventy-page notebook, 
is cheaper than, or I mean, is is lighter than than you know a, a thirty pound book or whatever. So. Right. Uh, what one, one comment you made in there is also is another case for me specifically. I never host games. I don't think I've ever been the host of a game. Um, so for me, as the traveling gamer, always it's just uh, so much easier to carry my pound and a half tablet than it is to carry thirty or forty pounds worth of books with me. So, and uh, <clears throat> what I have on the whole thing is. Uh, I was waiting for you to, to go there, Donald, but you never you never went, so I'll I'll take it there. Is uh, purely just a, a housekeeping um, mm. aspect of it. If I have um, a tablet sitting in front of me, I am more likely to be distracted by w- other things that are on the tablet than if I have the book in front of me. Um, exactly, as Netflix opens up on on Deb's tablet, I can sit here and watch Star Trek instead of talking to you, lovely folks. Ex- exactly. So <laughs> I I think that as a as a sign of respect for to you know the the GM who's running the game for us, if I have you know a D and D book or a Pathfinder book or a Mutants and Mastermind book open that you know that I'm going to use in the game, I'm less likely to peruse that. Thank you, Danielle Freeland. Mm-hmm. Then. I am if I have the ability to watch Netflix or to play Angry Birds or to throw paper in the trash can game, whatever it is. So that was Transformers Beast Wars. In case any of you cared, so uh, it, it's just yeah. to me. It's just, I'm highly it's just more a, distracted if yeah. I have my laptop in front of me. You know, it, it's the whole ooh shiny. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do that, too. That I think, funny enough, is going to lead us really nicely into the. The discussion you that chair is going to be the bane of this episode. It's, it's Derek's chair. We blame Derek. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> right now, you can't see. Michael, Michael has just stood up. Yes, yes. and, and our dogs are like freaking out. Yeah, exactly. I'm ready. So, <laughs> okay. with that being said, I think it leads nicely ultimately to the discussion. So I'm going to kind of lead us in that because it also puts a challenge now on the game masters. Um, technology has made it more difficult for a game master to keep people's attention. And I love technology. I use it for everything. However, that also adds that element. It makes game masters better because they've got to do something now that's going to keep them from going, wait, anger, huh? Mm -hmm. What'd you just say? Instead of playing Angry Birds, they're now wrapped back into the story. So I I think that's that's an element that maybe we need to discuss as well. That seems like a uh, viable option. So I guess we're going to talk about um, kind of the pros and cons of what technology has done to gaming. Um, And and by gaming, we can include things like the fact that uh, Words with Friends are coming out with their own board game. And I don't know about you, but yeah, when I grew up, that's called Scrabble. Scrabble. Uh (laughs) Yeah, I think it still is. I don't think Scrabble has gone Uh, out of business. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but yeah, what? (laughs) Yes, exactly. 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 So... You know, you have all these people who have spent all this time with words with friends or draw something, mm-hmm. um, and now these things are, are moving into the realm of a physical board and a physical game, uh, purely on this fan base of people who played on their mobile devices, their iPads, their iPhones, their Android app. You know, I have both of those apps. Uh, well, you know? <laughs> I, I do as well. So, However, I, I, will, I will not go buy friend. the board game. Yeah. No, no, no. I'd rather play Scrabble. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess we're uh, you know we can talk about um, from our perspective. You know, we have a quite a range of people who dabble in technology, or those of us that do not. Um, so, what does that do, or what has that done, or what do we think will it do to our gaming? So, anyone have some quick insight? opening so- I mean, opening start. thoughts? Unless you have something already, Deb. Well, um, technology, again, as I had mentioned, it does bring a challenge to the game master. Uh, but it also needs to test the player. You know, the player needs to actually have, show some self-control. And it's, whether you're bored or not, you should not be sitting there playing games or browsing the web while you're in a game. You should not. I'm not saying I haven't. I'm saying that you should not. <laughs> uh, Amen to that. All right, I just want to, okay, hang on. Who at this table and in Tampa, Florida, 
has been so bored that they've started playing on their phone. They're they're texting. They're doing. They're not in the game because the game is so boring. I, I think we all have. Um, raise my hand. Right. I'm putting it higher, higher than anybody so, else. So, okay. Just right. for those who can't. <laughs> what? Can Michael talk. is just yes. on his yes. phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're gonna go with a yes. Okay. So I'm just gonna put what, that out there. But what I'm saying is, is that really, I think, I think. Every player needs to take it upon themselves to try and challenge themselves to work past that. Game masters are really try, especially in tabletop situations. Game masters are really trying their hardest to tell a story, and because as many people are taking on, this is a collaborative storytelling situation. You need to be in and ready to collaborate. And if you're not paying attention, you can't collaborate. Again, I am just as guilty, so I'm saying this. Because I'm hoping I'm preaching to the choir because the entire choir is singing flat in this st- scenario. We, I think a lot of us need to really focus on that and not let things get in our way. But on the same note, the technology's there to speed the process up. If you need to look up something and look it up quickly, oftentimes go into the PFSRD or the D20 SRD or anything along these lines on the web to look up quick information on feats and abilities and how much things cost. You should be using that to speed the process up and not slow things down. If you're going to bring it, that's what you need to do it with. That would be that's my kind of stance. Well, I guess um, if we're going to talk about how we feel about all this, um, I kind of I'm very similar on, on your stance on things that I think that um, I've been in I've been in rooms with players who have uh, been so distracted by something else that they're doing. That when it comes to their turn, their initiative, or just, hey, are you going to talk to this guy who's trying to talk to you? And they're like, huh, what? And then now everyone in the game is being affected because now the, the game master has to turn around and explain to this person everything that just happened that they should have been paying attention in the first place. Then that takes me and I'm like, well, I'm going to sit here for another 20 minutes. Let me get my phone. And then I start doing the exact same thing. Um, so... I don't know. To me, uh, as far as when you talk about using the process to speed everything up and being able to access, um, you know, what exactly did that feat say, or, or what exactly does this spell do, or whatnot? Um, there's a lot of resources that can give you that information. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that if I come to the game and if I don't have the stuff printed out available to me, I probably shouldn't be using those abilities, whether they're my character abilities or not, because it puts it does the same thing. Okay, Mike, what are you doing? Okay, well, I'm going to cast this third-level spell. Uh, I, I think it's um, death to enemy. Um, uh, I don't remember the range. I'm not sure what kind of save he makes, and I'm pretty sure that there might be spell resistance. Well, what the heck do you know about the spell? I know it does damage. How much? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get the book, and hold on. I'll find out. So then the game pauses. You go and find your information. Oh, okay, well, there's... It's not a it's not a touch spell. It's a range touch spell. So I'm I'm actually I'm going to retro and, and back up. I didn't move forward. Mm-hmm. So hmm. then you start getting into that mess. To me, it sounds like a, a preparation problem over a problem that it, you're trying to solve with an excuse of having technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <clears throat> much but, like much like Bonnie when she takes notes on stuff that, that's mm-hmm. going on. I do that as well. However, I know that there's the complications of spells, and I mean, good lord, who in the world wants to write down? you know, 45 spells or whatever you have when you play a spellcaster. Now, with that being said, the the uh, additions of, like, Hero Lab that literally make an electronic copy of your of your character sheet, um, when, awesome. we, when we were discussing to talk about this... Um, you mean when we were preparing for this we, discussion? When, when we were, right? <laughs> Surprise. Um I made I made a very uh, bold statement. I don't think if I have the option, I will ever use a physical character sheet again. Um, you know, I mean, there's the novelty of having the sheet written out and all that stuff, but uh, the fact that I can still print a sheet and have it available, which I like. I like having it there so mm-hmm. I can have it in my hands. Um, and I even know that even printing it off of Hero Lab, I'm limiting myself on what Hero Lab actually can do. Like, Hero Lab is meant for you to play with it open in front of you so you can change your condition and add modifiers and this, that, and the, so it can just track all of your stuff for you. Click mm-hmm. a spell and it tells you exactly what that's Right, track your, uh, you know, your resources, your ammunition, all that junk. That's what it's there for. Um, 
But on the same aspect, there's like 43 pages to Hero Lab, and it's another thing to be like, oh, well, let me just read this over here while the GM is talking to Carrie, mm-hmm. and and then all this, and mm-hmm. it, yeah, it just becomes a game of, you know. I'm Mike the GM and I'm telling this story and at this particular time I'm talking to Carrie so now all the rest of you don't feel like you're involved. Right. And I feel that, that that's where it's it's moving to because there are other things that will keep you involved or keep your attention. Um, so it, it's just, like you said, it's just this big struggle from GM to player to try and keep everyone enveloped together. And like you say, I don't think there's so much uh, you know, role-playing games as they are collaborative storytelling mm. games. And I think that the collaborative storytelling gets washed away when we start getting distracted and unplugging ourselves from the game. Donald? Um, first of all, I would have to agree with uh, a lot of what both of you have said. That's good, because you'd be off the show if you didn't. Right, you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I would also like to add that... Uh, it seems awful dictator-like to just get rid of people because they disagree. <laughs> no, no, or... or this fit, isn't or, a democracy, though. Uh, is this, this is a micocracy. That's right. <laughs> um, or more of a Don being on the fence. Uh, I'm not on the fence. I'm not on the fence. Um, but you're seeing both their sides. No, I just said I agreed with both of their points. They're not opposing points. Yeah, we're not exactly opposing points. We're not. No, I guess that's true. <laughs> this guy... <laughs> He's in Tampa, so we can't punch I him. know, right? <laughs> so um, next week, all this all what? this data is being delivered digitally. He's distracted, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I do have the inter- interdimensional beats in the background. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, what I was going to say is, uh, to me, I feel like uh, your example of someone coming unprepared. You know, maybe they have a spell they want to cast. Maybe they're paying attention to the action that's going on, but then they get distracted, and then it's their turn, and they're like, oh, well, this is what I wanted to do. Okay, well, you know, what's the spell range? Uh, Is there spell resistance? What's my save? How much damage? Oh, I don't know any of that stuff. To me, I feel like a part of that distraction, if you're not necessarily prepared to the point where you have all of your spells written out longhand... I think that's understandable. As a GM, I would not expect you to show up with a notebook full of, especially if you're like a wizard or if you're someone who has a spell book. I mean, that's all you almost have to have the book in front of you in order to be able to handle a character like that. Um, but at least having a loose knowledge on where to look for your spells and and really my point on this on this particular uh, scenario is. Um, a lot can be said with someone who, even though they show up unprepared or, or underprepared is what I should say, underprepared for their type of character, if you're not being distracted by other third-party means, you can take the time to look in the book yourself and find all of that information, and then you can be prepared for when the GM comes around and says, okay, well, uh, it is your action. What would you like to do? Okay, well, I'm going to cast this spell. What spell are you going to cast? Uh, I'm going to cast Power Word Kill. Okay, what does that do? And then, you know, you have all of the descriptors for them so that you can just move the action along because it really uh, it really creates, to use a technological term, it really creates lag in the game when you don't know uh, what your character can do and is doing. And a lot of that can be... Um, a lot of that can be... Uh, alleviated, fixed, yeah, and alleviated with removing those distractions. Something else that ha- I have seen before, though, is people who are distracted by non-technological means. Um, there have been times, and uh, you so know, you've fallen asleep. I, well, I mean, you fall asleep, or yeah, I mean, Josh I and I have done that before when we've played a game that started really late, and maybe we worked the night before, like and you just yep. you're just tired, you know, and. You're, yeah, or if you're playing with people who like to run for very long amounts of time. I love playing a long game if it starts earlier. If it starts at 6, anybody on this show and anybody in my family can tell you, I turn unless I have a, an accessible means of caffeine, I turn into a pumpkin, pumpkin. around 11.30 or 12, especially yep. now yep. that we're... Have, have pushed our time back. It's more like 11. So it's like, um, you know... It's, so it's really hard for me to stay if unless there is some sort of captivating action, it's really difficult for me to stay focused on what's going on in the game if I'm not the GM. Now, um, I have seen before, and uh, 
I think this, you know, this is definitely something that we all deal with because um, there there could be knitting at the table, there could be crocheting at the table, there could be reading other books at the table, whatever. To me, I feel like it all comes down to respect for your GM. If you don't have respect for your GM, then it's easy to get distracted because as a collaborative storyteller or as a collaborative game, you are all in a party together trying to help each other or hurt each other. I mean, depending on what kind of game you're playing or character, you have to be focused on the action at hand. And technology, I think it just makes those distractions easier to come by. Uh, versus bringing books with you or bringing crafts with you that you're doing. I mean, I've gotten distracted from action by just sitting there rolling dice aimlessly. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like if the, if the action is just not there, or if I'm not involved, if if inevitably the party gets split up and you have to deal with you know a group here and a group there, you know, if I'm not in the group that's being focused on, then yeah, it can become very distracting, especially if you're if you are understanding that. Whatever's going on is currently not in party or whole party knowledge. Um, so I think that really uh, distraction and technology and gaming in general, um, it all comes down to respect for the not only the person who's running the game for you, because I, I can tell you that for the game that I just started running or I'm getting ready to start running, I've spent the last month and a half preparing for that game because so I'm excited. Really, I'm really excited about it. I haven't run in about Me 3 too. years and I'm running for two groups uh with with simultaneously acting storylines that are about an hour apart from each other. I run a 4-hour session, we have an hour break. I run another 4-hour session with a completely different party because I really hate my life and I want to try and kill myself <laughs> via running for a game group apparently. Sure. Um but really um it would it would break my heart to know that I prepared for a month and a half for a game, and I look up, and half of my party is you know emailing or texting friends about what they're going to do after the game. I you know that's fine if you want to do that. If we need to take a five minute break, that's fine. I I get to the point sometimes where I'm just ready to stand up and stretch my legs, use the restroom. If you want to do it during then, that's fine. But I feel like it all comes down to respecting respecting your GM and respecting the rest of the party around you. Okay, I've got to ask Deb and Carrie to kind of chime in a little I, bit. I was here. getting there. Well, the, I'm asking, but it's a, a you know, I have a past with both <laughs> of them. Obviously, I'm married to Doctor Deb, and I've known Carrie for a long time. Long time. Um, and I've experienced both of this from them, and they have woken me up from the same scenario. So I, I, I'm kind of curious about uh, kind of where they stand in this situation. Don't care which one goes first. Go ahead, Deb. Don apparently <laughs> cares. Apparently. Okay. Um, honestly, what I was thinking about as you all were talking about it is I, technology or no technology, the problems of tabletop gaming will not go away. You basically laid out the issues with it can happen whether or not you have technology in front of you, meaning you break the party up and this party is over here and I'm not going to get to say a word really about my character for 45 minutes. You're going to lose me. Now, how do you fix that? That's a whole nother topic. You I know, agree. But that's a problem to keep people involved in doing that. I can think of the gaming situation that we'll all think of that we were all exposed to very large parties doing a lot of really weird things and how many times was i totally lost bored sorry i came a few times because the action was not keeping me involved it was two or three main characters and everybody else was just sort of there waving in the background that is not a good gaming situation there was not a piece of technology to be found in that whole thing except maybe one laptop that the gm had that was it. But don't worry, everyone was very well distracted without any technology. So I don't think that technology will solve the issues. And I'm not really sure technology makes it that much worse. Maybe a little worse. Okay, yeah, you can be watching Hulu Plus on your phone now. Okay, that's a little worse. But I'm sorry, compared to some of the nonsense I saw, Hulu Plus might have been a plus. Okay, compared to some of the situations and things that I've seen. And I'm not going to say it because I got children that are listening to this. But, uh huh. Hulu plus plus. Uh -huh. plus. Yeah. It's like plus um, C plus plus. And the other thought that I had was. <laughs> 
ultimately the role playing experience is supposed to be human interaction with each other. Even if it involves, even if it's over Skype, even if it's, you know, even if there is some distance there, it's supposed to be the, the human element of interacting with players. It's supposed to be that role play back and forth. It's supposed to be, let's solve the puzzle together. It's not supposed to be, I'm off on my own in my iPad. And if technology takes away from that experience, if it takes away from that you know, let's all put our heads together and figure out how we're going to beat this dragon. If it takes away from that, then I don't think that it's it's a good thing to have. Ultimately, what is best for that game? If you're in a game where everybody does have technology, but they're focused on that game, you know, they're they're on track, they're excited, they're using the technology to help keep things moving along, great, bring it, awesome. If you're with a bunch of people who are all, ooh, butterfly, and they're clicking on Hulu Plus and Angry Birds and everything else, and they're not staying in the game, then I think the GM needs to make a judgment call and say, no, we're, we're going to just have to put it aside. We're just going to work off of paper, and we're going to work off of books for now. And so I, I think the GM or the DM needs to be able to make a judgment call about some of their games. Tony? You're muted, bud. Earth to Tony. Uh, uh, for me, it really boils down to this one basic statement. As long as the technology is not a kinder distraction device, it's fine. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> the KDD. Yes. Because it, it, when it ticked, uh, hey, like, like me, when I, try, when I use my tablet or something in a game, I try to stay off of it. I really do. So that way, I'm in the game, I'm more active in the game, I'll use the device for what I have to, and then try to stay off of it. Um, but when it really does become a distraction device... It really needs to be, okay, you need to relinquish the device or turn it off for the period of time for the game. So, um, because really that's what it boils down to is you're there to play the game. You're not there to mess with your phone for, for however many hours. So, if you're there to play the game, come to play the game. Don't come to just sit and do nothing. Agreed. And I think then that may be another great discussion topic. Hint, hint, whoever is writing that down, maybe me. Um of how to, you know, I've never run a game. I've never GM'd a game, but several of you on this table have, and we're missing our main GM who will be back in town eventually. Of how do you keep the player's attention and keep things going when you have those challenges? Like, you know, you've got the split party, or you've got the one player who's got 6,000 things that he does in his turn. You know, those challenging things. How do you keep everyone involved? That's a puzzle <laughs> that I bet people have been trying to solve for 40 Everybody's years. Everybody's looking at Michael. Uh-huh. I don't know what you're men- talking about. I'm not going to mention names. I refute Porn. that evidence. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Shh. Mm. Anyway, um, but then that would be an awesome discussion topic for a future date because I'm sure we've all been trying to solve this since Gary Gygax first put, you know, dice to board. Before he put two Ds together. Before he put two Ds mm. together, um, trying to solve that. So, Sorry. You know what? I Sorry. Think, I think it's okay. I, Carrie, we'll, we'll needs to, okay. Carrie needs to tune in on this, too, because she was involved with that gaming group like- I mentioned before I was. So, Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm probably the most inexperienced gamer at this table. Or That's all right. Noobs settled. are okay. <laughs> noobs, so. noobs bring new... New perspective. perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have an app on my phone, so that has Pathfinder books and stuff on it. So in that way, I like technology because even when like all of the books are taken up, I can still go, hey, what was that? You know, I can look at it and um, just get a quick reference. So, um, but I also have fallen victim to the being distracted by technology thing. I'm planning a wedding so <laughs> that's a big distraction in in itself so um pinterest yeah bad distraction distraction <laughs> um but also i think it makes a difference of who the gm is and how they handle the game and how they keep the players um you know interacting and and the story that's going on because with with derek um i i don't think that i've ever really had a tr- had trouble not being you know involved in stuff and and also i've gotten distracted during your games but um it's probably one of my favorite characters now (laughs) so um mostly because she likes to fight dragons and she rides a dog and she's awesome uh (laughs) yay gnome paladin yes so um but i'm kind of really excited that Derek is coming home and get to play her again in his epic game so um 
I was involved in the big parties where there were like 16 people trying to play one game. And now that I've seen how you can do it when you have a set time and you have a set amount that can sit at the table, it makes a big difference. Really, the big group turned me off to gaming for a long time. So, uh, Just real quickly, um, I know... There's a lot of a lot of things that we we uh, will discuss uh, as the show goes on that that we we see as kind of a distraction of what happens when when you know gaming goes awry or whatever. Um, but I also think that there is there's a time and a place where all of those things fit. Um, like Don is talking, he's running a game with uh, nine people in a table, and then another uh, another game where there there were supposed to be ten. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will I will agree that originally I was. Uh, much like Carrie, I was kind of like mm, ten people, you know. Um, but that to me is just if if he is going to take on the challenge of having ten people at the table, mm-hmm. ten people at the table is not my is not my problem as a player, right? You know what I'm saying? My my problem as, as a player then with ten people there is to how in the world am I going to get ten people to laugh at my bad jokes? <laughs> then you know, just the four we normally play with, yeah. But um, all that, all, I mean, to, just to kind of brush all that stuff aside, most of the things that we see as gamers as distractions, uh, as far as just the interaction with gaming, is is a game master hurdle that they have not been able to get over. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, that you don't find yourself distracted in Derek's game. I have yet to be distracted in any of Derek's game. Uh, not that I was distracted in, in many games that I play because I'm pretty loud, I'm pretty involved, and I will make myself known um, pretty much what I want to be accomplished. Wait, who are you? Your mother. <laughs> oh. So, oh. Um, He's a saint. <laughs> then I guess that's me. Uh-oh. So, uh, um, And also, I'm like eating my mic so i'm pretty soft spoken right you know i kind of like playing the background characters you know so i think that's kind of um you know something i shoot myself in the foot with but then i decide to play paladin and <laughs> fall welcome in love to, with welcome it. to the front line the, right <laughs> but anyway like i was uh, like i was getting at is uh, a lot of those are, are good natured and good hearted things like having lots of people to play because there's lots of people that want to play Right. Um, but then how do you balance that? How do you not just be like, hey, yeah, everybody can play. And then now no one's going to have fun because there's 43 people at the table and I get 12 seconds to say what I want to do. And then you won't get <laughs> back to me. Everybody's all falling asleep. And you won't get back to me for another hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, then you just – these are all just challenges that GMs face. And it's just the, the process that you whittle down. Okay, I know that as a GM that I am really good at – running bad guys. Mm-hmm. I am really good at putting a challenge in front of my my players that will make them test their mortality. And you know, and you just start finding where your strength is as a GM and then you just start playing into your strength. If you know that you as a GM get distracted when there's 14 people playing, mm-hmm. don't have 14 people playing right. because if you're distracted, good lord, your players are already asleep. <laughs> yep. True. True. So, you had something, yes, Josh. Yes, I do. Um, know your strengths and weaknesses. Yes, indeed. It's funny because this. I know this. This whole top original discussion topic was the pros and cons of technology in uh, the gaming environment, as it may be, and it's of course turned into something completely different, which again no. will be discussed even more later. Uh, the great bonuses of podcasting, but I am gonna. I'm gonna ask now because I've heard cons from technology as part of the distractions. Um, I, as a technology guy, am going to kind of shoot out now and kind of provide some provide a pro and maybe see if others can as well. Uh, I actually none. I already spoke on this a little bit in, on a Kick to the Dice Bags Master's Edition thing, but I am a major proponent of the virtual tabletop environment and concept because we have friends, one in Oklahoma, obviously Derek in the military, uh, currently, you know, Anton cur- down in Tampa, we've had others chime in from different locations and we wouldn't get the opportunity to play with those people had it not been for virtual tabletop because they're not here. They can't be here. And, uh, the nice thing when you're, you know, the type of guy who's addicted to technology in general, you try and make it the best possible experience. Like they're in the room right now. I mean, we're having a conversation with Anton and he's up on a TV. He's not here, but 
it's we're, it's no different. We're treating him just the same as we would. We still make fun of him. You know, it's just kind of part of the deal. Um, no, I hate you. Yeah, huh? <laughs> but uh, the virtual tabletop environment provides the option to play with those that you may not have the opportunity to play with. I know a lot of people, I, I heard a I, really good podcast about I do them. miss the sounds, though. Yeah, some of the sounds are pretty, yeah, if we got D20 Pro back up and running. Oh, yeah. Um, I still own the license, so we can use it <laughs> for healing. But um, I don't have the money to put a big giant touch table down here to make that happen. So, uh, but with that being said, again, I totally blows my th- I heard somebody say in another podcast. I can't remember off the top of my head which one it is right now. It may have been that same one. Uh, it may have been uh, actually Fear the Boot. But somebody made the comment that their gaming has completely changed now because they've switched to a fully virtual system. And it was mainly because they can set their time. He's, he's married. He has kids. Uh, and so he won't play till after 9 o'clock every night. But he has worked out with his wife that he's he gets home from work, sits down, has dinner. He spends time with the kids, puts the kids to bed. His wife goes to bed, and he stays up for three or four more hours and plays with friends around the country from 9 to 1 in the morning or something like that. And he's set his own time. He doesn't have to worry about the 45-minute drive to a friend's house and the 45-minute drive back home real late at night. He doesn't have to worry about lugging his books and so forth back and forth because it's right there. He's already at home. You know, and it and it's it's provided him the opportunity to not only play role playing games but also be with his family. And virtu- that would be next to impossible sometimes without a virtual tabletop environment. So I'm going to say that is a major pro for me. Anybody else have any? A pro for me would be Hero Lab because I always used to take like six million years to make a character because I just didn't understand it because the first character I played was like crazy like 40 second yeah. level character and didn't start out you know the first level so um, but I absolutely love Hero Lab and the fact that I can make a character and keep up with the guys around this table <laughs> so <laughs> what you got Tony uh, I'm gonna second Hero Lab but, um, but also for me it's same aspects is like what I mentioned earlier about the library basically and Josh gets a new book you guys are a thousand miles away from me and I can still have access to the new book so even if I was in the room with you guys and I had access to the book there I can still have access to the book here that's a real big benefit for me is then I'm not struggling to try and figure out what stuff I can get what stuff I can't get and we don't and I'm not I wouldn't. I'm not going to say I would would waste my money because it really wouldn't be a waste. But uh, I'm not duplicating purchases that we already have as a group. Where in in a normal standard situation where everybody's in the same room, we as a group have a collective library. Everybody has access to the the large volume of books. Um, where me as a remote, well, I won't. So that is really a big benefit for me is I can still have access and update books, and it. I can still keep. I can still keep up and play. I will say that, um, as I've watched uh, technology kind of creep its way into gaming, um, I've noticed that the uh, the I guess the quote unquote table that you play on gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, where uh, you know we're sitting at a rather large table, but that was built primarily for a, a really large board game. Um, but you know, I remember sitting down to play D and D with Don when he was introducing me to D and D and there was like four or five guys there and each four or five guy had like a TV tray for books and like a section of the table that was like their section of the table where they could lay stuff out, um, and, and, it, and, and it was two. It was two tables and as, next to each other. Yeah, too. And, and as a new player, and I'm sure that that Carrie will back me up. Um, when you walk into something like that, you're like, "Ha ha!" That's I don't, a lot. I don't know what's going on right here, but uh, those guys are creepers. <laughs> um, yeah, and the fact that there's like Mountain Dew like all around them, and they're piled up with chips, and I'm just like. How long are y'all, y'all going to sit there? <laughs> They're like Only four twelve hours. hours. Yeah. So, so you know, I've watched the I've watched the table shrink, and and much like Josh was talking about the virtual tabletop and the ability to play with people across the country, uh, I see the huge bonus for technology is you can literally play anywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Like I can pick that iPad up, sit it over here on Dr. Deb's table, and I can, you know, I can go next door and play a D and D game just based out of her book, you know, out of her iPad. Um, you know, and you can take that and you can say, I could play D and D in a car and roll dice in a shoe. Mm-hmm. Didn't you guys play Fiasco while you were driving we around played, Florida? We've played Fiasco in the car. We've played a version of the Star Wars role-playing game by changing the rules, playing with cards by Campfire, thanks to actually oh, yes. Anton. I remember that. that. Was awesome. Um, we've played, yes, I, think we, I said Fiasco already. We played D&D in a similar fashion as well, just using the, the high-low, because we're like, we didn't have any other options, so we, we, did, and we didn't realize. We played... Uh, we played uh, Three five on the way back down from Chicago after Mike's uh, bachelor party uh-huh. too. <laughs> yep, most yes, of that for about two hours, and then everybody <laughs> fell asleep but in the yeah. van. But well, not yeah. everybody. Yeah, some of us tried. But uh, I just think that you, you get away from uh, everyone gaming in mom or dad's dungeon basement. Mm-hmm. Uh, you yeah. know, and, and so. I guess on the on the positive spin of things is the stereotypical gamer is changing. Uh, you don't have the greasy haired. I mean, you do, but you don't. They're not all the greasy haired kid with the Mountain Dew cans and the chips piled up around them with the five foot desk with the books everywhere that everyone sees. You know, now we you have, have girls now. Now you have well, yeah. that, they were there before, but you're right. We do have them. We're a lot more. But now, yes. now you have, uh, you know, they're toting an iPad and uh, you know whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's all it's they still need. Still a case of Mountain Dew. Still though. a case of Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're not in mom or dad's dungeon. Yeah. No. And I mean, seeing the sun is a good thing. <laughs> sure. I have plenty of it. Uh, yes. No one asked you. Shh, shh. Um, I would have to say, uh, kind of building off of where you were coming from, like you like to do, like I and like if do. you were participating in the established <laughs> facts drinking game, <laughs> oh, you just took a drink. You did. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, uh, what I what I have really noticed on top of you know your iPads and and uh, laptops and and Hero Lab and all of those uh, amazing advances in gaming and technology, um, one thing because I am uh, I am probably still way behind the curve when it comes to that kind of technology as far as my everyday gaming uh, comfort level because as a GM I like to have my source material in physical form right there next to me I like to bring my bag of you know 72 billion sets of dice um, Amen. I, I like to have all of that stuff physically there but one thing that I have noticed uh, on that end of things is where maybe where maybe 20 years ago or you know even 40 years ago when uh, when the tabletop role play world kind of had just started uh, and met its genesis, um, there are a lot of. Uh, first of all, there are a lot of gaming materials much more widely available, especially you know in central Indiana in the Indianapolis area. There's there's a game store, a hobby game store of some kind, in almost every corner of Indianapolis. Um, and then even if there's even if there's no physical like hobby game store where they run Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of the stuff that you want to find, uh, you can also find at a lot of comic book stores and things like that here in Indianapolis. Barnes and um, Noble. Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I mean you can find source material at at Barnes and Noble. You can find uh, dice at your you know your corner comic book store and and things like that. You can find a lot of miniatures um, from places. Um, but one thing I have noticed more than anything is it seems like there's a, a much larger uh, access to, um, like, transportability for games. Um, an example I can think of is uh, we have a lot of friends who have been gaming for probably 10 or 20 years longer than we have. And um, a lot of them carry these huge rolling what were at one time I'm, I think are like toolboxes and things like that just full chock full of games with magic decks and with uh, d20 um, dice and and uh, books and games and I mean you know this is like a 50 to 70 pound box that has wheels on it that they roll everywhere that they go to play games and I think that's really cool but 
I don't have to have something like that to have access to easy portability for my gaming things. I went to the craft store the other day, and maybe it's just ingenuity. Maybe it's not even an advancement in gamer tech. Maybe it's just me being way too inventive with the things that I have in front of me. Slash cheap. <laughs> Slash cheap, sure. Um, that works, too. But I didn't want to replace the, I had a big tackle box that had all of my D&D minis in it, and I didn't want to replace it with another tackle box. I was like, you know, if I'm going to be running at... Uh, Josh's house, which is uh, about halfway across town for me. Um, I don't want to be carrying, you know, a big bag of books and all of my dice and a huge tackle box with my minis and my battle mats and all this other stuff. I want something that's going to be a lot more portable. So I went to uh, the craft store and I found some uh, some actual jewelry. Uh, uh, Organizers. Uh, thank you. I. It's okay. Yes, um, but yeah, ju- uh, jewelry uh, like portable jewelry organizers, and I used it to start storing um, minis in. And what was cool about it is I figured that, or I, I figured out that I could also be a lot more selective, and I could uh, sort them out in a much more orderly fashion, so that I have like the top three discs in this uh, jewelry thing are like my. Uh, heroes minis for people to use that are players and then the bottom two are like the beginning of all my bad guys and then I have a small bag with some other bad guy minis in it that I'm going to use for our games but it was just kind of cool that like instead of me having to carry this huge tackle box with all my minis in it I was able to find some things that substituted for that that make my ease of of playing and traveling to play a lot easier and um, I just I think there's a Again, maybe maybe it's just uh, being creative with the things that you have in front of you, but I think that there's a lot of really cool avenues that gamers have started to go down to make their gaming life a lot more fun and a lot more streamlined with their regular lives. And it, it you know, um, not to go, I, I don't want to keep ranting, but I think that it's also encouraging to see, uh, even though there are some people that still feel. Uh, the opposite of this, I think it's still really encouraging to see such a huge increase in gamers in in the world, and at least people who are coming out and saying, you know, yeah, I'm a geek. Yeah, I've played, you know, maybe I've played it's D&D cool D&D for 30 years. Now. Maybe I've played D&D for three months. But Geek chic, as they're calling it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yep. it's really encouraging, and it's really cool. Unlike a lot of people who have the opinion that, you know, oh, well, now it's cool to walk around with, with horn room glasses and pins in your pocket, you know, whereas 20 years ago you were considered to be a freak of some kind. Steve Urkel. Yeah, I, I, I find I find <laughs> that the increase that. in um, attention that the gamer slash geek genre is getting is only positive. You know what yeah, I mean? Man. You don't see a lot of you don't see a lot of negative negativity towards that unless it's coming from interior. Which is kind of discouraging, but you know it is what it is. Tony, two things. First off, I'm gonna call it Deb for playing Fruit Ninja. <laughs> Dis- distracted <Yep>. podcasting. <laughs> I was well, listening, and I didn't really uh-huh. know what else to say because I'm not that creative. And I'll be honest, I wouldn't have come up with that. So it was but like to, hmm. to touch on what Don was saying, though, is I, I completely agree. There is a lot um, with the with the becoming of geek being popular. There is a lot more people focusing on um, ways to advance the technology of um, gaming. So you're not, I'm not just strictly talking about physical technology. I'm talking about um, everything from, like you're saying, carrying devices and other things to just ways to make playing games easier, more fun, more portable. Wireless and- controllers. Yeah. Wireless controllers, um, just everything that is making just playing games across the entire genre simpler, easier, more fun. And that's just one of the things that I really do like about the advancements of basically geek culture becoming a popular culture is that so much of the technology, like a good example, the table that we made. I mean, that really, I mean, it, we wouldn't have thought about doing that 10 years ago. But we, and we also didn't have a need for it then. Um, but things like this, but like the table idea that Josh and I have come up with, um, that really is something that 
we could pursue, but I mean, it's just a matter of doing it. There, but there's a lot of more inventive stuff coming out with with this with the the branding of the culture being more popular. It's just a simple uh, economic uh, ratio, you know, as the supply of people who want that goes up, the demand for the things that make it easier, make it faster, make it better, make it more uh, enjoyable will will go up as well. Um, so, I, I mean. Did that help, Josh? Did we hit some uh, positives for you? I think we did. Deb, did you have any? She married you. Well, yeah, well. Mm. That's a huge one. <laughs> I, I, I am her technological bonus. Yeah. Yes, that is true. Uh, and technology doesn't work well unless he's around. This is kind of the negative. But um, mm. You haven't been to some of our podcasts. That's... True. Mm-hmm. Amazingly enough, I wasn't at the last one, um, which we're going to skip over for the moment. I but uh, uh-huh. he did. Yes, yes, I heard. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly do think that the ability, especially of computers, to be able to put such a tremendous amount of information in, in small places, you know, all of the things we've talked about, iPads, you know, laptops, whatnot, is a plus it's just like anything else that it needs to be – its power must be used wisely. Um, With great power comes, comes great, great responsibility. responsibility. Exactly. And I, Thanks, Uncle Ben. Uh-huh, pretty much. <laughs> um, now give me some rice. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. And I, obviously, technology is not going – anywhere um you know unless we're, we enter the apocalyptic age but i think that it just needs to continue i think we need to continue to have conversations like this and ask ourselves you know is the technology helping us or is in some places does it hinder us and figuring out what is really the best for each gaming situation because every gamer really is in a different situation of the the people that you play with the distance that you play over all of those things i think the use of technology changes depending on the scenario that you're in and so um in most of our scenarios it's a very positive thing i can there's some occasions where i can imagine it would be a very difficult thing um if any of us decided to go over to let's say africa and for some bizarre reason we decided we really want to play D D in the middle of the outback um you know, it's in Australia. Australia. Yeah. Hang on. No. Hang on. No, no, no. <laughs> Australia is the outback. You can go play. I don't want to play in the Sahara. She was providing like two to separate oh, okay. Yeah, two not separate the same. bizarre all right. places. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we all went to the same I'm place. sorry. The Serengeti. Are you happy or not? The Serengeti yes. in the yes. outback. There. Are we okay I'd, now? I'd rather play in the Congo. But... Oh, 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 you can play in the Congo. Okay. So where are we plugging in in the Congo? I don't know. We'll play in Kokomo. So that, I, yeah, exactly. I bring my, so, I bring my books. You know, so. So, there you go. Exactly. Okay, time I'll bring for- a solar panel and a 12 volt battery. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, you would. You would be the one to do that. And, and yeah, it's, a, it's a dumb example, but it's still, it's pointing out in certain situations, it, technology may not be all it's cracked up to be. But in most situations here in this country and what we do, I do see it, it as mainly a plus. It's funny you mentioned that because mm-hmm. that's something that Fear the Boot just discussed. Apparently, a couple of years ago, they did a like a fundraiser type thing where they sent off to veterans mm-hmm. uh, gaming packs, mm-hmm. which basically was like, here's a book, here's notebooks, here's dice, here's pencils, you know, mm-hmm. everything you would need to play a game because they assumed they had nothing. Right. And now two years later, they're like, we could have saved a ton of time by having an e-reader mm-hmm. and a bag of oh, dice. Yeah. And that's everything's in it. Yes. And for most they can vet- charge it. Well, for, most, at, for but- most military folks, charging phones, to anything of that nature, they have access to it. Okay. Yeah, they do. So, okay. Yeah. Tony? I have to say, um, while I don't know if this will get used as an established fact, it is a good fact for it. Um, use, of ecto- use of technology should be responsible use. Um, because it, using technology in gaming should be responsible use. Don't use it to just goof around. Use it to enhance your gaming. I would agree with that. So, um, as we, as we uh, close the door on the discussion of technology and gaming and its uh, positive or adverse effects. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot. I feel like we've kind of opened some doors uh, for things that we could talk about in the future. Um, and I also feel like that we've uh, kind of gave technology, um, I guess, a run for its money, almost. Yep. Uh, so, as we established last time... Uh, when it becomes necessary for bad things to happen to good characters, it is necessary for them to roll a D4 and a D10. 
Always, especially if you roll down a hill and slam into a tree. But the benevolent wizard will be there to pick you up and give you an artificial limb. Exactly. That apparently gives you plus four to strength. <laughs> but you can never hold anything in that, right, in that hand. Leg. Yeah, the girls just have no leg. idea what you're no, talking about. Huh? Arm. Arm. No, no, no. No, Carrie. Just correction. The three of us have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pause in the delivering of the established facts so we can explain this. There is a background roll-up that was used by our former Game Master, Daniel, that uh, in one particular section of the background roll-up, um, every, every section had, like, titles, and it says literally verbatim in the text, when bad things, when bad happen, things happen to, to good characters, characters, it is necessary for them to roll a D4 and a D10. So the D4 and the D10 becomes what they roll as far as table. what happens on right. this oh, table. Okay. Okay. So there's... However many options of things that could happen to them. And one of them happens to be you fall down this hill. You hit this tree at the bottom of the hill. Something horrible happens to you. Um, the benevolent wizard is there to fix you. However, he gives you like an artificial limb. So you can get a plus four to your strength. However, you can never hold a weapon with that arm or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's complicated. Okay. Yes, but hilarious. Nevertheless. All right. On with the show. Michael, astonish us. Don't, don't, do <laughs> Anyway. I'm doing a drum roll. You just can't hear it. Oh. That's probably for the best. <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure his rhythm sucks. <laughs> oh. I'm laughing at your joke. You just can't see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Don and I are friends. <laughs> anyway. He laughs at all your jokes. So today, based on our, uh, our chat of technology, I would uh, have this to establish out of our show. Rather, you are a slave to the slide to unlock or a master of the drag and drop. Remember this. With great power comes great responsibility. So choose hero or villain for your gaming group. (laughs) With that being said, don't forget to vote on the Villains Tournament 2012. That's right. We close voting on... Uh, the Thursday. day this yes, well, this is being released Friday, so we're starting the new round with this. Oh, that's right. So we we, all, we hope we you have voted. already closed voting. Right. <laughs> there should be a, a a update on YouTube either Friday or Saturday to yeah. kind of explain the new brackets and so forth. So yeah. keep and then going. We'll do a fun results show and yeah, we got some time. But we're thanks gonna... for joining us, everybody, on our discussion of technology in gaming. Deuces. Bye. Go Voldemort. <laughs> Jafar. Bonus! See ya. So I had to. I- <laughs> <laughs> you stole my bonus! Bonus! Uh, hold on, can we do that one more time? Not so loud. Uh, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Please visit us at www.theestablishedfacts.com and our Facebook page, facebook.com slash theestablishedfacts. If you'd like to support us by buying some merchandise, visit cafepress.com slash castingrobot. Bonus!